Greetings, friends. I thought we'd have a tale of two Viking swords today. We're going to be comparing a sword that's been featured previously on the channel. This is the Henway Tinker uh, Viking sword, which is uh, a lot of fun, but we have the chance to compare it to a friend's sword. This is an Albion Klontar, uh, which is currently discontinued. Um, this is a cool opportunity to compare two swords that superficially look very, very similar. They're of roughly the same size and of a very similar design, both uh, Carolingian-style swords from the Viking Age. They're commonly called Viking swords. Again, the uh, raiders from Scandinavia would have had swords similar to this, but these type of swords are often also called Frankish swords or Carolingian swords, swords from that period of time, um, anywhere from the, let's say, uh, 8th century through the, uh, the uh, 11th century have a, a form very similar to this and were used throughout the uh, throughout Western Europe in particular. Um, and this is a good chance to, to compare how two swords of very similar configurations compare to one another, but there are very different price points. This one currently retails for, I think, around 350 bucks US if you pick it up at Cult of Athena, whereas the Albion, even though it's out of uh, production, would have been over, well over a thousand dollars. Just uh, putting down the, the Hanway for a second. Putting down the Hanway and, and taking a look at the the Albion. Um, if we take a look at it, you can see that it's got just a kind of plain leather grip wrap. It doesn't have any risers. It doesn't have any cord impressions going on on it. Here, I'll bring it close to the camera. It has some lovely engravings all over it. We'll uh, list the uh, the style of of pommel, and it's um, this style of grip is actually very comfortable in the hand. Um, a lot of folks have difficulty holding Viking style uh, swords. I have very large hands and very long fingers. I wear large style men's gloves. Um, for this particular one, I don't have any trouble fitting my my hand inside of the grip. And on top of that, all of the the ends are rounded. Since this is an old sword that's been out of production and through many different hands, I don't know if from the factory they come like that, but certainly by this point, none of the corners are sharp. They've all been nice and rounded and are very easy to the touch. And so if I put it in my hand, especially getting that pinky right there down on the pommel, um, it's very comfortable and secure and I don't have any problem locking my hand in position and uh, do, performing either draw cuts or extended cuts uh, from the blade. Um, the blade is obviously wide and not quite parallel. It has very slight amount of taper all the way down to the edge and a kind of rounded, not quite spatula point um, at the end. It's fuller actually is very shallow and it strays very, very little amount uh, towards the end on this side. I have some marks on it from when I was doing measurements, but on one side of it, the fuller wanders just a little bit towards the tip. But otherwise, it's a, a very nice fuller. Again, this is a very old sword, but um, the uh, finish on it still is uh, pretty consistent all the way down where it hasn't been uh, <laughs> left uh, uncared. Um, something interesting about it, this um, I guess it's kind of consistent with what I've seen with other Albions. It, its final edge is not apexed. So there's always this big debate as to how sharp a production sword actually needs to be. And we can, we'll, we'll show the comparison between the two in a second. And so perhaps this is a good time to compare. So if I pull up the, the Hanway for a second, this sword has edges that are just about toothy, not quite entirely sharp. And if I put put it through a piece of paper, it cuts mm, a kind of jagged hole through it. I don't think it would bite into a piece of paper. Let's see. Yeah, it just misses biting. By comparison, by contrast, the Albion will not really cut paper at all. So here is our first point of, of difference between the two swords. The Hanwei has a, a final edge, and it's not the sharpest sword. It, it really could probably be sharper if 
we want it, wanted to go up against light targets consistently. Um, so it, I would say it needs final sharpening in order to be a nice, good backyard cutter. Um, however, which is going to cut better? Because this one is a little bit, it's a little bit finer than butter knife sharp, but it doesn't have a final apex on it. Again, I can run my finger up and down the Albion A-OK. -okay. Let's go into the backyard for a second and do some, some test cutting. So now we're back. So what, what's going on with the difference between these two blades? Well, we have a couple things going on that's, that's different. Um, for one thing, the edge angles are different, but that in part is due to not the, uh, not the difference in profile taper, but the difference in distal taper. This blade, the Hanwei blade, is about a millimeter and a half to two millimeters thicker than the Albion at pretty much all points along the, the blades, to the point that even though they're very similar in profile, the Albion is thinner, and as a result, the it is allowed to have a primary bevel with a more acute angle. So I measured it at a couple of places, and it admittedly is a little bit of a, of a rounded edge, uh, but you end up with maybe 13 degrees um, at some points, whereas with the Hanway you're at 16 plus on on an edge. Um, so the uh, the Albion has better geometry for cutting, even though it's not sharp, and that allows it to convincingly go through a variety of targets. Now there's a bigger discussion there as to what your final edge needs to be, and it depends on the type of sword, and it depends on what targets you're going after. Um, I'll probably have another video where I compare, again, two different types of sword. One that's sharp, but wide, has a wide secondary bevel, and another that has a narrow secondary bevel, but doesn't have an apex. And we'll see how the two do against a variety of different targets. So, this one also is much more comfortable in the hand. If I just... So if I pick both of these up, and I just wiggle them like this, 
it feels like I have better control over the Albion than the Hanway, even though these swords weigh basically exactly the same amount. They're within, I think, 30 grams of one another in weight. The Hanway feels heavier than the Albion, which feels lighter. It feels heavier both here at the hilt. The hilt feels like it's more sluggish and doesn't move around as much as the Albion. And it feels like it's harder for me to control the tip. And it's all because of the distribution of mass. I'll bring the Hanway up. We'll flick it. Get a little bit of a note. Do the same thing with the Hanway. Or with the Albion, the Klontar. That sounds nice, doesn't it? Love hearing a blade sing. So, this obviously has tighter fittings. It feels more maneuverable in the hand. It can outcut the Hanway. Is there anything the Hanway does better? Ah, there's one thing. Penetration. So, if we take a look at how well the Albion does or does not penetrate, take a look at this footage. So if we review these numbers and compare them to the previously recorded test that the Hanway Viking Sword put up, you'll see that the Albion Klontark does not penetrate particularly well. On my previous testing footage, a lot of people wrote in remarking how well uh, a Viking-style sword could penetrate after we had reviewed the, the Hanway Sword. And it's true, the Hanway Sword, if we get right down to the, to the tip, has actually a very pronounced and acute tip for thrusting. By contrast, the Albion is significantly more broad, it's wider, and it doesn't come to as fine a point. And that is, seems to be reflected in the, the testing. It's also a more flexible blade, whereas the Viking sword, the Hanway sword, is almost 30, I believe, 30 kilograms of weight, this one is closer to 16 kilograms and is a significantly more flexible blade. And as mentioned previously, it is not fully sharpened. So all these things factor into it turning into not excelling in the th penetration testing that I, I do. So that is one thing that it does not exceed and beat out the, the Hanway blade in. But everything else, it makes it for a much more convenient one. I was talking about how comfortable it was to hold. I have to admit, if we're comparing it to the Hanway sword, when I was trying to do the cutting with the Hanway sword, the fittings here are just, the edges are, are very, um, they're not quite sharp, but they're just bordering on it. So even when I get my hand in the position for it, and the grip here is probably a little bit larger than on the, the Albion, the edges are just a little rough, and between the fact that it wasn't cutting through and I was getting some hand shock back, um, it was just not a pleasant experience <laughs> using the, the Hanway for, by, uh, the Hanway by comparison to the, to the Albion. So there you have it. Here's a quick comparison. Um, it turns out that if you're willing to spend more money, you do get a much nicer sword out of it. The Albion is a, a very lovely example of the type of swords that was used um, during this time period. It is a very powerful cleaving sword. And it's not to say that there weren't swords that handled more similar to the Hanway during that period, but uh, 
if I had to guess which one was more representative of what you're likely to see during that period, my money would still go on to the Albion. Okay, until next time.